Hello human beings, Power Gamer here. Pop quiz, how do you instantly make a terrible game better? Like that. Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Sonic and Knuckles, two halves of a perfect whole. The ultimate conclusion to the classic Sonic games. This lovely pair has honestly one of the most fascinating development histories of any video game. Much like Sonic 2, the game was developed in America by STI. <laughs> I know I'm beating a dead horse, but I'm sorry, I will never get over that name. However, the team ended up being split into two separate divisions. The Japanese developers would work on Sonic 3, while the American developers would work on the spin-off game, Sonic Spinball. Since this was Sonic's third, or fourth outing, the developers wanted to make this the biggest and best looking Sonic game yet, with a deeper story, more details, and a larger amount of levels than ever before. And they were actually planning on making some elements of the game pseudo 3D, but since that technology was still in development, they decided to scrap the idea until Sonic 3D Blast came out in 1996. Originally, this was just going to be one complete game, but sadly they weren't able to fit everything they wanted on just one Genesis cartridge at the time. And Sega had already signed a deal with McDonald's to make a tie-in promotion that could have ended up not happening if the game was delayed. So they made the decision to split the game in two. Yes. The games were separated primarily because of McDonald's. The first half of the game, titled Sonic the Hedgehog 3, was released on Groundhog Day, or in this case, Hedgehog Day, 1994 in North America, with the rest of the world getting it shortly after. The second half was released worldwide a year later as Sonic and Knuckles on October 18th, 1994. But since there was no way to connect Genesis games at the time, Sonic and Knuckles was a special cartridge that allowed for the newfangled lock-on technology. By opening the top and plugging Sonic 3 into it, you connect the two games into one cartridge and can play through the whole thing as one game titled Sonic the Hedgehog 3 and Knuckles. Both games sold incredibly well, with them selling a combined total of 4 million copies worldwide. And reception for the games individually was a bit lacking, but together, people regard this as possibly the best Sonic game ever made. Although some people still give that title to Sonic 2. But interestingly, this game doesn't get re-released as often as its predecessors. It still happens, just not as much as Sonic 1 and 2. I played this game before, and while I didn't finish it, I had a great time overall. And yes, I'm going to bet you talking about these as one game, since that's what they were originally intended to be, and let's face it, that's how everyone sees them nowadays. Nobody talks about them separately, they only talk about them together. Obviously, I'll discuss the differences between keeping them separate and combining them, but for the most part, this will be just one game. Either way, it's time to finally finish off the classic Sonic games with arguably the most beloved one of all. The game takes place shortly after the events of Sonic 2. After the destruction of the Death Egg, Dr. Robotnik wound up on Angel Island, a mysterious island floating in the sky thanks to the power of the Master Emerald, a giant emerald that contains a power so strong it can nullify the energy of the Chaos Emeralds. Robotnik discovers this and seeks to use it, but the emerald is guarded by Knuckles the Echidna, a powerful warrior who's the last in a tribe of echidnas that protected the emerald for centuries, and he looks as much as a real echidna as, well, Sonic looks like a hedgehog. Sonic and Tails go to Angel Island to track Robotnik down, so he convinces Knuckles that they're the ones trying to steal the Emerald. So Knuckles goes to stop them while Robotnik secretly plots to use the Emerald to bring back the Death Egg. And Knuckles ain't messing around. As soon as the game starts, Sonic becomes Super Sonic, presumably because he wants to get this game over with quickly, and Knuckles just freaking uppercuts him, which reverts him to normal, and he swipes the Chaos Emeralds. Much like the other Sonic games, the story is pretty straightforward, and it keeps up the tradition of adding a new major character with every game, with Knuckles easily being one of the more popular ones, and one of my personal favorites. He's got a fairly interesting backstory, and he's overall pretty cool. He pops in from time to time to cause some trouble, but he's honestly more of an inconvenience than an actual threat. We have Tails back for this adventure, but Amy is gone, though she didn't really contribute much, so I can live with that. And when you start up the game, you're greeted by... Saving! 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 Yes! Much like Super Mario World for the Mario series, this was the first Sonic game that actually let you save your progress. Not only does this mean you don't have to beat the game in one sitting, but it also means you don't start from the beginning if you get a game over. Thank God. Although weirdly, the save feature is only in Sonic 3. Sonic & Knuckles doesn't let you save unless the games are connected, I assume because they wanted to save costs. Remember how I said they wanted to make this the best looking Sonic game ever? Well, they freaking nailed it. This game still looks phenomenal. It's amazing they were able to make a Genesis game that honestly looks better than Sonic CD in my opinion. The bold colors, the unique environments, the animation and sprite work on the characters, it's all incredible. Although there can be some major slowdown and sprite flickering when Sonic gets hit, but that's only on certain levels. Other than that, it's fantastic. And the music, oh, oh, oh yeah, the music! This is possibly the best soundtrack of any Genesis game ever, let alone a Sonic game. It is all absolutely phenomenal. There isn't a single bad song in the entire game. Which isn't too surprising given that the soundtrack was partially written by Michael frickin' Jack. Jackson. Yep, the King of Pop himself actually contributed a large portion of the music for this game. Although, his name was taken out of the credits before the game was released, and Sega has never confirmed why. Some say it was because of salary disputes, some say it was issues with different people writing different songs, some say it's because of certain, um, 
allegations that were going on at the time. This whole soundtrack has a really strange history to it, especially in terms of re-releases. A large reason this game doesn't get re-released as often as Sonic 1 and 2 is largely because of the soundtrack, and a large amount of the ones that do happen actually use completely different music from the original. Honestly, I have no idea why. Is it because of Michael Jackson? Well, he's dead now, so I can't imagine him throwing a fuss. Maybe other people hold the rights now, maybe Sega just wants to distance themselves from it, maybe Jackson was never actually involved at all and this whole thing is an elaborate rumor. But throwing all that to the side, the music is easily the best of any Sonic game we've had so far, and the presentation wasn't the only thing that got a massive upgrade. The game follows the same philosophy as before. We all know what Sonic's motto is, have to go swiftly. But the developers definitely succeeded with their goal of making the game bigger than ever before. These levels are absolutely massive, and they have tons of branching paths you can take. This game almost always rewards your curiosity with tons of rings and power-ups. And speaking of power-ups, instead of the shield from the previous Sonic games, we have three new elemental shields that protect you from certain hazards and give you an additional ability if you press the jump button while in the air. There's the bubble shield, which lets you breathe underwater and do this bounce attack. It sadly doesn't let you move faster in the water, though, and it's not as good in later games since only a handful of levels actually have water. In them. It's still a great power-up, just not as good as the other two. The fire shield makes you immune to fire and lets you do this dash attack, which is great for taking out enemies, and it can let you reach new areas. But the best one is the electric shield. It protects you from electricity, which is pretty situational, but it also lets you double jump and draw in rings. This thing is awesome, easily my favorite of the three. But those aren't the only new additions. Sonic's moveset has been slightly altered. The super peel out from Sonic CD is gone, and the spin dash is back to its normal strength, which I am more than okay with. But Sonic has an amazing new ability the insta-shield. If you hit the jump button while in the air without an elemental shield, Sonic will get the small area around him for half a second. This serves as an extension of Sonic's hitbox, which makes you invincible to certain hazards for a brief moment. It can be tricky to get the timing down, but if you do, it is insanely useful, especially against boss fights and hard-to-hit enemies. The game definitely takes more inspiration from Sonic 2 than Sonic CD, partially because of Sonic's moveset and partially because it brings back an old friend in a vastly improved way. Like in Sonic 2, you have the option of letting Tails follow you around, and he works the same as previously. He can also be played on his own and allows for simultaneous multiplayer, and he got a massive upgrade, because now he can actively use his two tails to fly. Yeah, that wasn't something I forgot to mention in my Sonic 2 review, Tails could not fly in that game, believe me, I tried, but here he can take to the skies wherever he wants as long as he wants, until he gets tired. If you're playing in multiplayer, Tails can actually grab Sonic and fly him up to higher platforms, which is insanely useful when you're trying to explore or grab something you missed, and he can even swim, which is amazing. Tails is a bit slower than Sonic, but he's still really fun to play as, and is totally the easy mode of this game. Although he's only available in Sonic 3, and Sonic and Knuckles, he is not an option. Instead we have, well, Knuckles. Yep, that's right, you can actually play as Sonic's newest rival, but only in Sonic and Knuckles. So thanks to that lock-on technology, in Sonic 3 and Knuckles, you're free to select any of the characters you want. Knuckles is very much the strong, sturdy type. He's the slowest character of the three, and he can't jump very high. But he can glide in the air if you hold the jump button, climb walls, and smash things just by walking through them. All three of these abilities are actually incorporated quite a bit into the level design, so there are many areas that only Knuckles can reach. But sadly, his poor jumping skills make it so he's the worst for dealing with boss fights. The best way to break down the characters is Tails' is easy mode, Sonic is normal mode, and Knuckles' is hard mode, but he's still really fun to play as. Both Tails and Knuckles can't use the insta-shield, though, or the secondary powers of the elemental shields, and I am 100% certain they did that because with those, they would easily be better than Sonic. Well, at least Tails would be. So far, every Sonic game has had its own bonus levels that you have to do in order to get the Chaos Emeralds or Time Stones, and this one is no exception, but it works a lot differently from before. We go back to the Sonic 1 and Sonic CD approach of entering bonus levels through giant rings. But unlike those games, the rings are hidden in fixed locations rather than possibly appearing at the end. Remember how I said the game rewards your curiosity? A big reason for that is because of these things. Jumping inside takes you to the most ambitious bonus levels we've seen so far. You're placed in a pseudo 3D checkerboard area that looks pretty impressive for the Genesis. You move forward automatically and have to steer Sonic left and right and occasionally jump. A bunch of colored spheres are scattered throughout the levels and they each do different things if you run into them. Blue spheres turn into red spheres red spheres make you lose, gold spheres send you flying, and white spheres make you go backwards unless you hit another one or just hold up on the d-pad. Your goal is to roam around the area and collect all the blue spheres in the stage. If you touch them all without hitting a red sphere, you get a chaos emerald. But the longer you take, the faster you move, and the harder it is to turn. And let me tell you, it can be really freaking hard to grab these things since there's a half second delay with turning and it's really difficult to be precise. Most of the blue spheres are arranged in a grid, and if you turn the ones on the outside red, all of the ones within will turn into rings. If you grab all the rings before getting all the blue spheres, you'll receive 
a perfect, which gives you bonus points. Yeah, don't bother going for the perfect, it's not worth it. These are probably the best bonus stages we've had so far. They're a bit harder than the UFO chasing from Sonic CD, but they're easily better than the ones from Sonic 1 and 2. The only real issue I have with them is Christ I stink, and the method of getting to them is better since you don't have to worry about holding on to your rings, although it can be pretty tricky trying to find them. But the biggest improvement from before is that you don't lose all of your rings if you go in them. But unlike previously, there's actually more than one type of bonus level. The checkpoint ring system makes a return, but now it only takes 20 rings instead of 50. Jumping inside takes you to one of three bonus stages, although certain ones are only in certain games. In Sonic 3, you're taken to this gumball machine where you have to hit the switch that makes orbs fall out. The orbs can give you rings, a shield, or an extra life, but you have to bounce on these bumpers to keep hitting the switch, and they disappear every time you hit one. Sonic and Knuckles has the slot machine that gives you rings. It's pretty much a fusion of the casino slots from Sonic 2 and the bonus stages from Sonic 1. In the other is this orb area. You orbit around these things, and you have to use them to grab the bubbles like in the gumball machine. But while you're doing so, this energy moves upwards, and if you touch it, the stage ends. These bonus stages are all pretty cool, and they give you a decent reward for keeping your rings without locking the best ending behind them. Every bonus stage lets you find continues, which might not seem as useful since you can save the game, but using one returns you to your last checkpoint instead of making you start the whole zone all over again. But eh, that's enough about the bonus levels. Nobody's actually here for those, and if you are, you must be very fun at parties. We're back to the older game system of zones with acts, and unlike previous Sonic games, some of the acts actually change themes within the same zone, so the first one will vary quite a bit from the second one. This is really cool since it adds a lot more variety to a game that already has a lot of varied level themes. The game automatically saves every time you finish a zone, and unlike Super Mario World, it actually keeps all of your lives and continues. But if you turn the game off in Act 2 of a zone, you have to replay Act 1. This is by far the longest Sonic game ever made at this point. Not only do we have the most zones total, with a whopping 13, 6 in Sonic 3 and 7 in Sonic and & Knuckles, but the levels themselves are absolutely enormous. There are so many ways you can beat these levels, and there are a bunch of paths that all connect to one another, which is a great way to give more replayability, especially with the giant rings. But unfortunately, this leads to the game's biggest issue in my opinion. Some of these levels go on for way too long. A lot of the paths being connected is really cool, but this means if you try exploring or just go the wrong way by accident, you can can wind up going in circles. The game normally has a lot of paths, but there are a couple of zones where there's only one way to go, and if you don't take it, it can take a while to try and get back. Because of this, it can feel like some of these levels never end, and this wouldn't be as big of a problem if it wasn't for the... Yep, they brought back the time limit from Sonic CD, and it's even worse here since the levels are so much longer. You still get plenty of moments where you can gather speed, but it's not enough to make the levels feel any shorter. Partially because this game has a lot of areas where you're not really doing anything, and the timer just keeps going, so that's nice. It also doesn't reset to zero when you die, and only does that when you run out of time, which is dumb. It really is a shame, because if they kept the levels just a little bit shorter, I feel like a lot more people would agree that this is the best classic Sonic game, instead of it being heavily debated whether or not this is better than 2. Thankfully, the level designs are overall really Really solid. They're more memorable than Sonic CD, and there aren't as many annoying moments like in Sonic 1 and 2. Each level ends with a boss fight against Robotnik like before, but now we actually have boss fights against robots in the first act, too. Beating the robot boss causes a sign to fall, and we get the most fun part of the game, seeing how long you can keep it in the air. And depending on where it lands, you can even get some free items. As is tradition, the zone ends with you opening a containment unit, and we actually get a small cutscene that transitions each zone to the next one. This really helps the game feel a lot more connected. Hell, we don't even get loading screens in between acts. For the actual zones, there's Angel Island Zone. Zone, which starts out as a typical grassy area, until the end of Act 1, where this robot sets everything on fire. Then you have to fight it after a solid 30 seconds of just holding the D-pad. It's really easy, just hit it in between flamethrower shots. The Robotnik fight, he's in the ship that shoots fireballs, and pops in and out of the waterfall. Next is Hydrocity Zone, or Hydro City as the Mormons call it, the obligatory water level, at least they get it out of the way quickly. You mostly have to use these hands that shoot you along tubes. It's better than previous water levels, but still not that good since it's one of the more linear levels in the game. The machine spins rockets around itself and swoops down, and Robotnik is in this thing that sucks up water and shoots mines. Marble Garden Zone is a grassy ruin area where you have to ride floating tops and spin dash these things to move the ground. The robot is this drill that causes rocks to fall, and it's basically an easier version of the boss in Mystic Cave Zone from Sonic 2. Robotnik uses these drills to destroy the stage, so Tails picks you up, and you have to jump on him while Tails carries you. Good luck trying to do this while playing as Tails, because it's rough. Carnival Night Zone is my least favorite level in the game. You have to ride these spinning drums, which are really irritating, and these bumpers bounce you all over the place. It's so annoying. The robot is awful too, since you can't actually hit it. You have to wait for these saws to bounce into it. And Robotnik drops these green orbs and shoots a laser. Ice Cap Zone is a much better level. The ice physics and these things can be a bit irritating, but the snowboarding in the beginning is pretty fun, and overall the level has a great aesthetic. Plus, the music is top tier. There's a robot that surrounds itself in ice crystals, and a scientist that freezes you in ice blocks. Launch Base Zone is a factory slash military 
military base where Robotnik plans to relaunch the Death Egg. You have to use a bunch of gadgets to get around the level and fight this thing that spins spikes around. Then you hijack one of Robotnik's ships and use it to fly to this really easy fight. He flies up and down shooting lasers, and that's about it. Once he goes down, so does the Death Egg. That's where Sonic 3 would end, but now we're getting into the Sonic and Knuckles portion. Mushroom Hill Zone is filled with fungi and has these things you have to push down on to move up. I can't help but think this level is a subtle jab at a certain plumber. The robot is a lumberjack that shoots wood at you and swings his axe. Act 2, the level is more fall colors, which is neat. You then destroy this machine, turning it back to normal, and chase Robotnik as he shoots fire and you avoid spikes. Flying Battery Zone is an airship with a bunch of moving parts and some killer tunes. The machine is a capsule that you have to make attack itself by slamming spike balls on its button. With Robotnik, you have to avoid this laser so he destroys his own ship, and then watch out for this thing with spiked arms and a swinging body. Sandopolis Zone is Sonic's first real desert level. You know, the one cliche level theme that everyone seems to hate, yet it's always used in games. Act 1 is simple, aside from these sand streams you can jump up in, and then this pyramid emerges with a robot in it. You don't actually have to hit it though, you have to lure it to the side to make it kill itself. Then you have to go inside the pyramid, which has blocks you have to move to open doors, switches you have to pull to keep the level lit, and things that fill up the area with sand. This level's not awful, but it goes on forever. Robotnik's in this thing you have to hit to reveal him, and then attack again while avoiding his hands and the spikes on his body. Lava Reef Zone is a lava level, and the prime example of a level taking too long, because it is insanely easy to wind up going in circles. I spent 20 freaking minutes on act one. You need to spend these things to move up or down, and then the boss is a giant hand, foreshadowing, as well as two spinning film strips. Act 2 changes the colors to blue until the boss fight where you have to keep moving or else you die instantly. Then find Robotnik at the bottom of a lava fall where you have to jump on platforms so these spike balls hit him. Just get the flame shield at the top, then it's ridiculously easy. Hidden Palace Zone, which is an obvious homage to the level that was cut from Sonic 2, is where you finally face off against Knuckles. And after all that trouble he caused, he is pathetically easy. After you beat him, he runs off and finds Robotnik hijacking the Master Emerald. Knuckles finally sees his true motivation, so he helps you escape to go find him. This leads to Sky Sanctuary Zone, which is only one act. It's ruins like Marble Garden Zone, only now you're in the sky. You also have this purple Sonic robot called Cyber Sonic. How many freaking robot Sonics does this guy have? Which imitates the Robotnik fights from Green Hill Zone in Sonic 1 and Metropolis Zone in Sonic 2. And in the end, he's like Mecha Sonic from Sonic 2. You then run up to this tower and finally reach the relaunched Death Egg Zone. This is light years more complicated than it was in Sonic 2, and easily the hardest level in the game. It's filled with obstacles, conveyor belts, disappearing platform beams, and these annoying cannons that are really hard to avoid. Act 1 ends with this thing that spins orbs around, and then these platforms with spikes on the bottom while shooting a laser. You really need to rely on the insta-shield for this. Then Act 2 throws anti-gravity on you, which is just great. At the end, you find this thing, which looks complicated, but it's actually really easy once you figure it out. Use these tubes to go upside down, and then spin dash the robots it throws. Now we confront Robotnik in this giant death machine. There's three phases to this fight, and two of them are easy, but the other the other one is awful. Phase 1, you need to avoid his fingers and then jump on them. But then Phase 2, you have to avoid this fire, jump towards him to reveal the Master Emerald, hit him, and then jump over this laser that is insanely hard to dodge, all while the platform slowly falls from beneath you. And if you die, you don't get any more rings, I'm not even shocked at this point. And then Phase 3, just keep running and hitting him until he goes down. The Death Egg is destroyed, the Master Emerald falls, and Tails saves Sonic as the game ends. Unless you're playing as Tails, then the roles are switched. And after the credits, one of Robotnik's minions from Sky Sanctuary Zone seems to return. At least that's what happens with Sonic and Tails, Knuckles' story is actually a bit different. It takes place after Sonic's campaign, where the egg-like robot from after the credits comes back and tries to wreak havoc. For the most part, everything is the same, only he's the one that ends every zone instead of Robotnik. But some of the bosses have changed a bit, with the biggest one being Marble Garden Zone, where you have to avoid him as he runs along these chains. Other bosses are slightly harder, and sometimes they just don't have it at all. And instead, the story ends in the ruins of Sky Sanctuary Zone, where Cybersonic destroys the Eggbot and you have to fight him. But once he seemingly goes down, he uses the Master Emerald to go Super Cybersonic, he chases you, shoots energy, and fires rings, and you can only hurt him when he temporarily runs out of power. Once he goes down, Knuckles falls, but is saved by Sonic, and Angel Island plummets, and we then see Cybersonic return after the credits. But wait, it sounds like I'm forgetting something, doesn't it? Like before, once you get the Chaos Emeralds, you can transform into Super Sonic. He works the same as previously, only now you have to hit the jump button twice in order to activate it, so you have more control over when you transform. But this time, the bonus characters can also collect the Chaos Emeralds, so Knuckles can become Super Knuckles, but not Tails, though. He 
doesn't get anything from the Chaos Emeralds. The super forms are amazing, but unfortunately, the super theme only lasts a grand total of three seconds. But this is where the biggest difference between keeping the games separate and combining them comes into play. Normally, you can get the Chaos Emeralds in both games, but here you can only get them in the first half. Once you reach Mushroom Hill Zone, the giant rings take you to Hidden Palace Zone, and you lose the Chaos Emeralds. Because now you can complete seven more bonus stages to unlock the seven Super Emeralds, which are even more powerful. Getting them unlocks Hypersonic, which is supersonic on steroids. He's even faster, flashes colors, and can do this dash attack, which is a bit rough on the eyes. There's also Hyper Knuckles, which is exactly the same as Super Knuckles, only he climbs faster and can slam the wall after gliding. And this is how you unlock Super Tails. Don't know why he has only one form, but whatever. Super Tails is easily the best one of all, since he has this tiny bird army that can decimate anything. But most importantly, getting the Super Emeralds, or the Chaos Emeralds for Sonic and Knuckles, unlocks one final zone, officially beginning a tradition for the Sonic games. The Doomsday Zone. Sonic has to fly through space while avoiding missiles and asteroids. You're completely invincible, but since your rings are draining, you're essentially on a time limit, so you have to keep collecting them. Eventually, you'll reach the ship and have to redirect its missiles so that it destroys itself. Then an egg goon will fly off with the Master Emerald, and you have to press the jump button to move forward and attack while he shoots at you to slow you down. Once he goes down, you actually return the Master Emerald, allowing Angel Island to float back in the sky. We see Knuckles guarding the Emerald once again as Sonic and Tails fly off, and you get this cool Sonic 3 and Knuckles end screen. Tails has the same ending as Sonic, only you don't play the Doomsday Zone, and Knuckles just has a different ending where he gets the Master Emerald back and returns it, allowing Angel Island to float in the sky once again. Knuckles is fantastic. Some of the levels go on a bit too long, but other than that, it is a phenomenal game. It's engaging, fun, memorable, and overall the total package when it comes to classic Sonic the Hedgehog. If you can get your hands on this game, definitely give it a shot. It is a must play. And with that, I have officially reviewed every single classic Sonic game. I gotta say, it was a lot of fun getting to fully experience these games from start to finish, despite all the ups and downs. I have even more respect for Sonic than I already did, so I guess the only thing left to do is rank each game from worst to best. Unsurprisingly, Sonic 1 is the worst, since while it has its moments, it's overall pretty frustrating to play. Then Sonic CD is a lot more fun, but it's also kind of forgettable. Then Sonic 2, which is a near-perfect game aside from the occasional bullcrap, notably Metropolis Zone. And then finally, Sonic 3 and Knuckles is the best. It has the most content, the best sound track, and overall the most of what you would want from a Sonic game. And if I had to split them both apart, then the ranking would probably be more like this. And before you ask, no, Sonic Spinball and Knuckles Chaotix don't count, because those are spinoffs. However, there is one thing I am forgetting. If you plug Sonic 2 into Sonic and Knuckles, you can actually play as Knuckles in Sonic 2, which is really cool. It's like DLC before DLC was a thing. And if you plug Sonic 1 into the cartridge and hold down all three buttons on the controller, you can play randomly generated Blue Sphere levels. And according to smarter people, there are exactly 134,217,728 possible combinations. If I'm actually going to get good at the Blue Sphere stages, I need to beat every single possible combination. Let's do this. 368,952 years later. I did it.